Greetings, and thank you so much for that lovely and generous introduction. I'm going to talk today about dignity and justice, locating HIV, mental health and social protection and human rights, and reproductive justice frameworks. That's just a little bit more about me, some of my other intersections beyond the biography that you just heard. And about my organization, Sister Love, where we work, the work we do, our mission, our vision, and our programs. When the UNAIDS put out uh, its more recent report, one of the things that brought joy to me and uh, gave me a lot of hope for the work that we have in front of us is that they are identifying something we've been really pushing for from a community standpoint for a very long time, which is centering the work that we do to achieve the targets to end HIV, centering all of that work on the lives of people who are living with HIV. And in terms of fast tracking to get to the end of the epidemic, the, the commitments that were made for the 2020 targets, we have failed or we didn't make them. We have fallen short or missed those targets. And now we want to make sure that we're adding to that. We're fast tracking what I'm calling justice and dignity as a way to achieve a faster way to get to those targets and to end the epidemic by 2030. Honing in on number for our conversation today on commitment number six, ensuring that people have that 75% of people living with at risk for or affected by HIV benefit from HIV sensitive social protections. We still have a long way to go with regard to that. So when we're talking about why we're focusing on mental health in the context of HIV prevention and care is because we're not going to get there to the, to the goals of either the fast track or any of our other goals that have been set in our individual country strategies to reach the end of the epidemic without increasing and enhancing mental health services, mainly because the way to get to the end is to follow the uh, HIV and prevention and care continua and mental health issues actually influence every step of our ability to achieve those targets across that continuum. Also, people who are living uh, with HIV or are at risk have significant higher rates of mental health symptoms or disorders. And we have to recognize that along with physical health, that mental health is also a human right and that we all deserve the right to access and to attain the highest standards of care. The burden of mental health is so high in HIV because of all of these additional factors, whether it's demographic, biological, community, a multitude of stigmas, psychosocial conditions, environmental situations, and yes, socioeconomic uh, situations, including income, education, and housing and food security. Depression and mortality among people living with HIV has been documented and is clear. And it's even more stark for women as is expressed in these three studies. In Tanzania and the United States, uh, the issue of the longevity of depressive symptoms has been directly associated with the elevated uh, chances or risks of mortality uh, with regard to HIV and these mental disorders. And of course, the longer the depression goes on, the worse the HIV healthcare outcomes will be. And the Positive Women's Network in the United States does a lot of its own community-based research. And they conducted a study centering women in HIV care and treatment, interviewing about 200 plus of their members across seven different states and jurisdictions. And here's some of the data that they came up with. Of course, that once you're centering women in the story, we're finding that about 90% of the folks that they interviewed are living below the federal poverty level, that they live in unstable housing, or they are reliant on subsidized housing, which depending on policies and practices and funding may not uh, be stable, considered stable housing, that they all have family responsibilities and that they are also reliant on subsidized health care by a huge majority. So here are some of those other ways of expressing that. The household income is extremely low compared to the federal poverty level, that there are many dependents in the household that folks are caring for, as well as elders, and that the housing situation is such that a predominance of the respondents have identified that their housing 
uh, is either subsidized uh, by public funding or by a family member or by aid specific housing, or they don't have a uh, regular stable housing because they are living in shelters or on the streets. These obviously are parts of those uh, safety net or social protection issues. When it comes to healthcare coverage in the United States, because of the Ryan White program, this is actually a more robust experience for people, especially those who are low income and qualify to participate in Ryan White because it covers people who do not have other means to take care of their medical needs with regard to HIV. So when it came to these respondents, about 100% had seen a provider within the last year. Almost 90% were taking their meds every day. And about 80% have reported that they are undetectable at the last time they got their lab results. But as you can see, an overwhelming majority have either one of the subsidies, subsidies for their health care or a combination of these subsidies, whether it's Medicaid, Medicare, or the AIDS Drug Assistance Program through the Ryan White initiatives that just about everybody responding to these had some form of subsidized health care. And when asked what they need to stay in care, the gaps in mental health were stark, that they recognized that about, uh, in addition to the 17% of folks who responded that they actually have been formally diagnosed with PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, an alarming number, 65% of them have actually been diagnosed with depression. A, same, a similar number reported that they needed to see somebody or wanted to see somebody for counseling. And about 60% of those who said they wanted to have been able to access therapy. And for those who have not, it was because of cost or the lack of coverage, like for insurance purposes, or the availability of those services at the time that they needed them. And some of these other issues are what they required to stay in care, numbering transportation case management and connecting with other people and having specialized care are among the top needs that were expressed. And then of course, about 90% of the folks said that they wanted to participate in support groups where about 20% of them were able to do so. So in terms of the recommendations based on their own study, positive women in the United States have said that they first and number one want an improvement in the quality of care that's provided by expanding the availability of sexual reproductive health care in the Ryan White program throughout all of its different parts, but also to make sure that HIV is included in the sexual reproductive health care services where over 70% of the women in the United States predominantly seek their uh, primary health and that there needs to be an expansion and an effort to institute trauma-informed practices that would enhance the availability of mental health services for people living with HIV, especially women. And these are their number one priorities in conjunction with the others that are listed here. If we switched a little bit to look even more at the structural impediments that also impact mental well being, that impact the safety nets or the particular social protections that are needed for folks to uh, achieve health outcomes of optimum uh, with regard to HIV, racism everywhere, systemic racism at that, which lends itself to individual racism, is critical. It may not be immediate. It may not be explicit in a given community or culture, but white supremacy, patriarchy is, is enshrouded um, around racism and that whether it's from north to south, from west to east, that those experiences are played out in policies and decision making and have impact on health outcomes. Dr. Dorothy Roberts also talks specifically about the role that racism plays in medical care with regard to diagnoses, with regard to uh, these misdiagnoses or non-diagnoses, especially with regard to mental health, actually diverts attention and resources away from those things that would actually help facilitate better health outcomes and have fewer mental uh, issues or mental disorders. Things like uh, food, addressing food deserts, uh, exposure to environmental uh, toxic situations, as well as some of the structural concerns around incarceration and uh, racial discrimination. Those are the stresses. So we say when we fight against HIV and AIDS, we say we're fighting for racial, sexual, reproductive justice and human rights, all of which are really speaking to human dignity. And with dignity, regardless of the mental health condition or the mental health disorder, there is an opportunity for well-being. 
some of those issues, of course, we have to address are the social and life determinants of health as they are indicated here. And I put them here in this word cloud because they are also very intersectional, interdependent, interconnecting, interlocking conditions and issues that are either determined because of my birth or are determined because of the social conditioning and the societal uh, situations or cultural situations in which we live. So if we talk about intersectionality and how we approach these issues, it was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw back in the late 80s. It was originally looked at as a legal uh, definition, but now it is a definition for looking at the social condition. And that is a concept that really basically describes how the multiple oppressions that exist, especially in women who have to deal with race or ethnicity, and might even have to deal with sexual identity, but also have to deal with gender conditions and the inequities that exist for us in those spaces. So from an intersectional standpoint, one of the responses to that has to be we look at all of the components of what should be given to us as inalienable rights because we are born human. And that would be human rights. And most of these are all identified and codified into the human rights universal declaration, into the conventions, into the covenants that have been signed on to by many different countries. And a lot of people walk with all of these situations and any combination of these in anybody's life could lend to some mental disorder, mental stresses, situations, conditions, or disorders. And that we recognize that with a human rights approach, we are then taking on one of the best responses to the HIV epidemic. And when we look at those people who are most at risk for HIV or who have been most impacted by HIV, we could actually identify that these are all people for whom their human rights have been violated or they lack a significant protection of their human rights. This is just another way of looking at that from our perspective, where I sit in Atlanta, Georgia, in the U.S. South, in the Deep South, <clears throat> which I always say is more than just a geographic distinction. But all of these things also coexist in terms of adding on to the stressors and then the negative or adverse outcomes with regard to HIV and its mental health components. So if I took a shift from the human rights framework to the sexual and reproductive justice framework, you want to talk about how those oppressions show up differently with regard to women and with regard to our sexual and reproductive health and well-being. We first have to look at what those intersecting oppressions might be. And some of them look like this, whether it's some of these heinous practices, for example, of incarcerating uh, mothers who are substance addicted or shackling, which is chaining them, handcuffing them to uh, the, the gurneys or the delivery tables when they are in birth or any of these other conditions that end up as oppressions that have direct impact on one's mental stability, on anxiety, on depression, and on other disorders um, that may end up as chemical or biological imbalances. I probably don't have time to go through this full video to explain what reproductive justice is, but you will have access to all of these uh, slide decks from this conference later. And so I'm hoping that you take advantage of uh, watching this particular video. But what I really wanted you to understand is the definition of what is reproductive justice. And when we say reproductive justice exists, it's when we have the human right to our bodily autonomy, including our rights to control our sexuality, our gender, our work and our reproduction and that we are keen to say that that right only exists when we can uh, that right can only actually be achieved and re made real when all women and girls have the complete economic social and political power as well as the resources to make the best decisions for our health for our bodies for our families and our communities in every aspect of our lives and so what does that look like in terms of challenges, similar to those reproductive oppressions, it looks like this. The planning, family planning options are severely limited for a lot of folks, given the kind of framework that uh, contraception may be offered in their uh, health systems or in their countries or in, even in their uh, local jurisdictions, that there are issues around criminalization and the anxieties around sexual activity, sexual behavior, the sex negativity that comes from us providers in a lot of instances, 
issues around informed consent and not uh, the enforcement of those protections that we are talking about today. These two, in addition to poverty, in addition to food and housing security, these two are issues of uh, social protection that we have to pay attention to. And because women living with HIV share so many of these common experiences, then we can't help but look at them also as intersectional issues at a community level. So intersections with violence and trauma across the board, gender-based violence, sexual violence, state-sanctioned violence, as you can see what we're dealing with in the United States with so much uh, brutality with uh, law enforcement and with the judicial system. But there are also issues around inclusion. There are issues around living in the margins. There are issues around poverty and economic uh, dependence that most people living with, a women living with HIV share and can express as you saw in the study that the Positive Women's Network conducted. I bring Brian Stevenson into my talk on a regular basis because he is my movement muse. He is a legal scholar and practitioner uh, protecting people who are on death row or juveniles who have been sentenced with life sentences or long sentences or juvenile sentenced to death row. And so he has a framework, what I call uh, strategies for sustaining social justice that are really important and very powerful. First, we have to make sure that the people who are living these experiences are the closest to the people who are making those decisions and that the people who are making those decisions are making sure that we are closest to those folks who are living those experiences and that we understand them, that we're not separating our understanding of what those lived experiences are. And that's another thing that we have to do is make sure that we're changing the narrative, that we're not talking about the problems that people have, but we're talking about the experiences that people are living. Because oftentimes the things that we think of as choices are actually non-choices. And so we have to change the narrative and how we describe and how we think of the folks who are experiencing mental disorders as, as living these experiences differently because because of conditions in their lives and in their bodies. We also have to be able to protect the hope. We have to be able to see and know that the future is still bright, that we can get to the end of HIV, that we learn about all of the treatment modalities, that we know what the new technologies are, and that we know that we are more than just the one problem that we may have, and that we are enough based on our lived experiences to find our solutions. And that we also have to be willing to get uncomfortable, be uncomfortable and make others uncomfortable because what I can witness is that most people who are comfortable aren't trying to change anything. Many of you have probably seen uh, these graphics before. I just put a tiny bit of a twist on them, wanting to make sure that when we're talking about uh, justice, that we're talking about not only achieving equality, because equality only means that we're using the same instruments and we're not changing the situation if we're not changing the actual barriers and the structures that are making it difficult in the first place. So equality and equity are not the same thing. And not only is equity not the same, but all types of equity are not the same. And the reality is that some people are given more privilege than others, and so they're set up to not win. And so when we bring justice into the framework and we cut out all of those impediments and all of those discriminations, then what we actually achieve is liberation and everybody can get in the game. I love Paula Freire, so I just leave this comment here uh, in terms of his quote. And, and now we want to talk about people in their own words. Billy Avery is my movement mother. She is the founder of the Black Women's Health Movement in the United States. And these are what I call her Billyisms or her commandments uh, in terms of sustaining well-being and taking care of ourselves. And these are other words that also identify our need to recognize, repair, restore, reinvent, and renew ourselves based on these things that we learn about ourselves as well as the folks that we serve. And I would be most happy with a little bit of time to close on the words of the women themselves. A lot of times we have so much going on in life. You become frustrated, you have all these different thoughts, and sometimes you're not even able to control those thoughts. I do suffer from um, anxiety and um, I've had traumatic experiences, but it doesn't necessarily mean my go-to is to medicate me so that I'm sedated. And then it was 
hard for him to see the panic because I couldn't paint him a picture of my whole lived experience. Love, that's a big picture, right? Housing is mental health, food is mental health, having friends is mental health. So if you're able to stay mentally healthy, then you're able to cope with everyday stresses. It means a lot to be mentally healthy, especially living with HIV. It really is important. It really is important. So remember, take care of yourself. These are some of my references. I thank so many people who have supported us and this talk. Reminding folks that our event, Women Now, is coming up. Please visit us. And for sure, contact me and follow us for more information. And with that, I thank you for listening.